It had been more than 400 years since God promised Abraham that his descendants would bless the world, but they found themselves in slavery in Egypt. Each day they cried out to God for a deliverer to set them free from their bondage. As the Israelites grew in number, the Egyptians increased their slave labor. Eventually, the Egyptian leader Pharaoh decreed the death of every Hebrew newborn baby boy. One Hebrew mother placed her son in a basket in the Nile River, trusting God's plan for his life. God saved the child, delivering him into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter, who took him in as her own child and named him Moses. Years later, after fleeing Egypt in disgrace, God called to Moses from a burning bush, sending him back to Egypt as God's spokesperson to tell Pharaoh to free the Israelites from slavery. Moses and his brother Aaron eventually obeyed, and a standoff between the one true God and the most powerful man in the world had begun in Egypt. Well, good morning again, everybody. We doing okay? You got a good warm-up on Exodus, right? A really good warm-up on where we're headed today, and I want to just, again, welcome and extend a welcome to everybody who is first time here today to Cornerstone. Super glad to have you. We love uh, meeting new folks, and we'd love to get you connected and help you with any information that we can today. Have you ever had one of those moments in your life where you kind of been going and going hard, and you're getting through life, and you just have a time where you start thinking And you wonder, like, all the effort you're putting in at work and all the time and energy that you've poured into relationships and all of the exercise that you've done and all the skill development that you've done, all the highs and lows of life, you ever get to a point where you just kind of wonder, what's it all about anyway? Like, where am I really headed? I mean, what is all of this for? Does, Does it really even matter now, most of us have been there. Most of us have been down that path a time or two. If you've not, perhaps your time is even coming. It's a time when you, you kind of leave some of those moments sometimes pretty discouraged. Like, I don't, I don't know where we're headed with things. It doesn't really matter anyway. Friends, today I want to give you an encouragement that there is more, right? There is more. There is much more. It all does matter. God does have a bigger plan in place. He is present and working In fact, the more that we're talking about is really what we're spending the summer discussing, specifically God's character and his desire to have a relationship with every one of us. When we have God in the proper place in our lives, many times the what's the point anyway kind of conversations and thoughts, they start to go away, but they mostly get filled with purpose and meaning in him. And if you've ever been in that place, then our summer series hopefully will resonate with you. Over the next 10 weeks, we're going to work through the book of Exodus. And maybe you've heard of Exodus and you're wondering, what does that have to do with my purpose? What does that have to do with me? 3,000 years ago stories, how does that connect to my life at all? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because here's the thing, uh, where we are, wherever we are, God is always there. Even in the the pages of history, wherever God's people were, in a sense, we were also there too. We can see ourselves in their stories, and more importantly, we can see God and his character and his love in those stories, and he's the same God to us today. And Exodus is one of those stories. Now, Exodus is the second book in the Bible. It's the story of Israel's deliverance from slavery in Egypt. We have a website that we mentioned that's loaded up with materials. Please spend some time there to dig deeper if you'd like. Specifically, I want to point out that we have a reading plan we've created to help you work through all 40 chapters. There's 40 chapters. It's a big book. But over the next 10 weeks, working through that in little chunks. So that starts tomorrow, and you'll have all week to cover a number of chapters in Exodus. Maybe you want to grab a study Bible like one of these big behemoths. And, and be able to sort of work through some of the stuff because not all of it is super easy to process right away because we don't have all the same experiences as perhaps what we have in Exodus. So as we jump in, hopefully we can have some fun together as we go through this. It's going to be a relevant and exciting time this summer. I want to start with some trivia questions. Let's do a little bit of Exodus trivia, shall we? As we start, grade yourself. There is no extra credit, and there is no score at the end. You just grade yourself, okay? See how you do. 
You get your answers in your head. Number, question number one. One of the main characters in Exodus is this Hebrew-born leader who grew up in an Egyptian home. He was found floating in the Nile River by Pharaoh's daughter and later would call for Pharaoh to let God's people go. If you listened, I already told you the answer, right? Is it A, King Tut, B, Moses, C, Chuck Norris, or D, Joe Mama? Select your letter in your head. It's not Joe Mama. And the correct answer is B, Moses. Anybody get that one right? Way to go. Okay, they're not all that easy. Number two. Number two, on Moses' way to Egypt to confront Pharaoh, God was going to kill Moses because he resisted being God's messenger to Pharaoh. He murdered, the Egyptian and hid the, murdered an Egyptian and hid the body. He married a foreign woman, or he did not circumcise his sons. Which of those is the reason God was going to kill him? That's a little harder, isn't it? A little bit harder. Pick your answer. The correct answer is D, he didn't circumcise his sons. Anybody get that one? Four of you. That's not as good. Okay. Number three. When God provided food in the wilderness for Israel called manna, what did it taste like? A, biscuits and gravy, you wish. B, unleavened bread. C, honey wafers. Or D, milk and honey. Pick your answer. Keep it in your head. If you shout it out to the other students, then that's a problem, okay? Keep it to yourself. You got your answer? Correct answer is honey wafers. Who said milk and honey? That was a trick question, wasn't it? Okay, is that the last one? One more. What did Moses do with the tablets of the Ten Commandments when he came down from the mountain and found Israel worshiping a false god? Did he recite them to the entire assembly, throw them down in anger and shatter them, he destroyed the golden calf with the tablets, or he hung them in the courtroom above the judge. The very first Ten Commandments, what did he do with them when he came down? He threw them down in anger and shattered them. Oops. Okay, who got that one? A few of you. Okay, anybody get all four? Just loud and proud. Yeah, nailed it. Okay, awesome. Don't skip church all summer if you got them all four. That was the, that's a warm-up, Okay. But there's a lot more that we're going to go over together. And if you're like new to faith or unfamiliar with Exodus and you're going, what are you talking about? Good news, this is going to come together in your life as we look at these stories. Stick with me throughout the summer, okay? The story of Exodus is completely foundational to understanding Christian faith and God's faithfulness to us as followers of Jesus today. It's actually the most reproduced book in the rest of the Bible. Everybody refers back to Exodus. So to understand and know God, in a sense, is to understand and know Exodus. The stories in Exodus are like 3,200 years old, some of them. They're really old stories. The location is not near here. Some of the names are weird. Some of the circumstances are hard for us to understand and grasp. But what we're going to find is that the story of Exodus is in so many ways our story. That the God who delivered and redeemed Israel is active in delivering and redeeming us. And the God who fulfills his covenant promise with Israel is faithful in fulfilling his promises with us. The God who made himself known to Israel is making himself known to us today. So I'm excited and hopeful that we're going to grow and be changed through the pages of Exodus this summer. To begin in Exodus, we're going to get our Bibles and we're going to open our Bibles to the book of... Genesis, the book of, Gen that was a trick, the book of Genesis chapter 12, and I'll show you a little bit of background as we head into Exodus together. Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, says this, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Sounds like military orders, doesn't it? I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, Abram, we later know him as Abraham, is one of the most important characters in history with the origins of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all funneling back to Abraham. Abraham's a big deal in a lot of ways. Now, God's promise to him is twofold. I'm going to make you into a great nation, and I'm going to bless everybody on the planet through you and your offspring, Abraham. Only one minor problem with Abram at this point. He had no children. 
So how do you bless everybody in the world and how do you make a great nation out of just his, him and his wife? Well, later, God fulfills his promise. Abram has some kids. He has some more kids, more kids after that. His grandson, Jacob, ends up having 12 sons, and the family that would ultimately become the nation of Israel was growing and multiplying quickly. Yes, eventually, Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. If you don't know what that is, just YouTube it later. You'll be, I'm sure you'll be blessed. But a famine came through uh, the region in their area, and they all ended up moving out of their region into the land of Egypt, and there they continued to multiply, they continued to grow as a family, they became the nation of Israel, and that gets us to Exodus, all right? There's a thousand years in 30 seconds. Now we will turn to, I know, it's tricky, it's Exodus now, we're going to turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 1, Exodus 1. Here's what he says at the very beginning of our book. That these are the names of the sons of Israel, that is Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. In all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. In time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly, they became extremely powerful, and they filled the land. And eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from, our, from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. Now, God is doing his part in fulfilling his promise to Abraham. They're multiplying. He's building a great nation. It seems like everything's going well until Egypt makes them all slaves. And their entire lifestyle is gone, and it's misery among the people of Israel. Now, they are praying for deliverance from Egypt. They're asking for God to get them out. They're asking God to rescue them from the evil hand of Pharaoh. And this is the first of multiple times in the story of the Exodus where we're gonna kind of find ourselves reading the text and wondering, what in the world is God up to? How is he gonna fulfill his promise by taking that turn? I mean, God was, his promise was being fulfilled. Everything was going great. But it's almost like, them multiplying rapidly was the reason Egypt got nervous and made them slaves to begin with. Like, God, thank you for your fulfilling your promises. Could you fulfill them slightly slower so the Egyptians don't make us slaves? That's not what happened. And we kind of wonder, why would God allow his people? Why would he call them to be his people and then allow them to fall into slavery? What possible good could come from all of that kind of pain? And that leads us to the first really big truth in the book of Exodus, and that's this, friends. God is good even when life is not. God is good even when life is not good. Because sometimes we know life is not that good. And while many times we can see the pattern of how we get ourselves into a situation that isn't the best, we make decisions to lead ourselves down a path it's decisions that cost us things, decisions that create circumstances that we're sort of stuck in. Sometimes we can see that, and sometimes we just can't. There's just too many layers. We don't know why certain things are happening. We don't understand how we got to where we are. We just can't see why things are the way we are. Was God faithful in his promise to Israel? Yes, he was. Was it a challenging and difficult time for the people? Yes, it was. Difficulty and pain and disappointment, they do not negate the goodness of God. On the contrary, 
God is often most seen in the midst of some of our most challenging days. We can see the hand of God, experience the presence of God, just really dwell in the richness of his love and his grace and how he speaks into our lives when we are going through some of our most difficult days. So do not ever confuse the character of God with the current circumstances of your life. We sometimes have a tendency to work off a false assumption that the quality of our life equals the quality of God's love. But friends, that is just not true. Life goes up and down all the time. We have good times. We have bad times. Circumstances change. But God and his character and his love and his faithfulness, those things always stay the same. God is always good, even when life is not. And the story of Exodus will remind us over and over and over again that in the times where we can't see the hand of God, the times when we're unsure whether or not he's actually really here and he's really present, the times where we're reminded that even though we can't see it clearly, God is always working, he's always shaping us, he's always ready to bring good out of every situation for his glory and so that we may know him more. And just like Israel in Egypt, what we are going through, what we're struggling with, the things that we're dealing with in life, or what he's doing with us today, or perhaps just the beginning of something that we can't see yet, a way he's gonna fulfill his promises to us in ways we just can't see coming. God knows. And none of this is taking God by surprise. He is good, he is working a plan to redeem and restore us and fulfill his promises if only we're willing to walk with him through the ups and downs. So we jump into Exodus. I want to pick up in chapter 1, now in verse 15. Exodus 1, 15. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. Good idea. Watch as they deliver. If the baby is born, kill him. If the baby is a boy, kill him, sorry. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this, he demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They're more vigorous and they have their babies so quickly we can't get there in time. And he bought it. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful, and, became, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. It's worth noting here that the names of both of those midwives are mentioned in the text, Shifra and Pua. But Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the most powerful man in the world, we don't get his name. And we don't know for certain why, but suffice it to say that the women in this story, this little small sub-story, represent a major truth in Exodus. And that is that God is always working to redeem and restore. He is pumping life in at every turn, even when you can't see it on the fringes, in the cracks, in a nation bent on death and control, God is working on the, on the fringes to pour in life and freedom. Again, that does not mean that there's no pain. That does not mean that things weren't bad. Things were bad. Things were bad for Israel. They were. Many, many Hebrew baby boys were ultimately thrown into the river. But God's plan to redeem and restore is always working. In the case of the, in the lives of these two women who feared God, even when their nation and their culture did not fear God, they chose to fear God and make a decision against the grain to honor God, and they were blessed. Their actions likely saved hundreds and hundreds of lives in the face of an edict that was bent on death. Now, with books like Exodus, we see how God moves in the bigger story. How God is moving with like the whole nation. He's working to save a nation and free the entire group of people. But he's not only working with the nation as a whole people. He's also working with individual lives like these two midwives. He's seeking to redeem and restore every single person while also speaking in and working on the whole. 
Saving is going to be a major theme that we're going to see all summer long in Exodus, from these babies to Moses to ultimately the whole nation. God is a God who saves, and he wants to take what is confused and what is broken and what is dying, and he wants to redeem it and restore it. He pours life into that which others offer death, and we're going to see that not only is he like that in the life of Egypt, he's like that in our lives too, friends. He never saves simply for the sake of saving either. He always has a redeeming purpose behind why he saves. He saves us so that he can form us and make us into something new. He saves Israel to make them into a particular type of people and the freedom that he offers to them. You could say it like this. God is worthy of worship and he wants us to know him. He's worthy of worship. It's going to be clear all throughout the book of Exodus. And he wants us to know him. He's not supposed to be this separated figure, this deity that's outside of time and space, and we have no idea of who he is. That's not who he is. If you've ever read the Bible, you've ever picked up the Bible and you just found yourself frustrated, like it's just hard to read, or even perhaps hard to believe, or you're wrestling in some way with God, I am so hopeful that this summer that our time together will help you, perhaps more than ever, really see who God is. Really see his character come through. And as we work through the book of Exodus, we're gonna see that God does everything in this story, all the way from um, allowing the nation to go into slavery, all the way into rescuing them from slavery and calling them into the wilderness, all for this reason, so that they will know him so that they will know him. They see who he is, and so that they'll know him. God calls Israel out of Egypt with purpose, not just to give them freedom from something. Yeah, it's great to be freed from something, but he calls them to freedom for something, to know him and walk with him each day. When we have freedom from something difficult, that's great, we don't have that pain anymore, but you know what's gonna come tomorrow, or the next day, or the next day? Some other burden some other difficulty, some other challenge. When we're freed from something for something, God, that's how God redeems. He saves us and rescued Israel into something more, a relationship with him where they are his chosen people to set an example, a life driven by his love and his guidance. He desperately wanted Israel to know that he was God. There was no God in Egypt or anywhere else that was gonna be able to match him. But he also wanted them to know him, to know him, to know his character, to know his love, to know his incredible, relentless pursuit of their hearts. And as his people, they got to be the example for the world. So there's this theme throughout Exodus that we're going to see. God showing who he is for this very reason. And this is the reason. So that you may know. This phrase comes up over and over. So that you may know. So that Moses would know, so that the evil King Pharaoh would know, so that Israel would ultimately know who he is, and so that we would know him as well. God's ways are not our ways. They're not, and they're not always easy to understand. And you can read through, I mean, people have been reading Exodus for 3,000 years. It's challenging to see some of the ways that things sort out. It's challenging to understand all of God's ways. But consistently throughout this book and throughout the scriptures, right up to today, we see the pursuit of God for our hearts and our lives. He is a God who can be known, and he wants us to know him. So if you ever struggle wondering, what's the point anyway? Is God really there? I mean, is he really in control? Is he really able to do anything in this situation? Exodus can help. And we will see God show up over and over and over again to make himself known so that he can be known. So the challenge today is really simple, right? Join us on this journey this summer. Jump in. Be here as much as you can. Dig in. Read the study guide or the study. uh, Read through the Bible reading plan. Look at some of the resources. Dig in a little bit. And let's see if perhaps God, God has something unique to teach us along the way as we go. I want you to think for a second as we wrap up here just about where you are in your life. Just think about where you are in your life today. 
maybe you're in a place where you've struggled through those conversations where you've said, I just don't know if God is really moving in my life. I'm not even sure he's present. I'm not sure he's there. Maybe you're in a place where you've had hurts build up in your life to a point where you've got emotional walls separating you from God today. Friend, I want you to know that the God who spoke into the nation of Israel in Egypt 3,200 years ago is today, right now in this place, here. He's here. He's moving in your very chair right now, in your spot, calling your heart to him, inviting you in to know him, inviting you to see the character and love so that you may know, so that you may know him. And so wherever you come from today and whatever you brought in here today, whether you're doing great, maybe some of us are, are having great success, things are going really great, you have everything you ever dreamed you could ever have, you got all of it, and you look around and go, is this it? Is that really all there is? And the answer is no, because Jesus, our God, is still looking at you and me and saying, I'm the point. I'm the point. I want to bring all things together for you. Know me. Know me. That's his invitation today. And maybe you're in a spot today where you know you need to take a step. You know that you need to talk to somebody about what it looks like to walk with Jesus, to accept him as Lord, to get more involved in things, to take a step forward. We'd love to have a conversation when we dismiss in a minute. Our prayer partners are going to be hanging around for a few minutes. They'd love to have a conversation with you about that. Let's bow in prayer today as we wrap up. Lord, we love you and are so thankful for stories like the one we have in Exodus. Lord, so many themes, so many layers, so many images of who you are and how you act and how you love and how you redeem. And Lord, help us to see through the stories this summer. Help us to see more clearly what it means to walk with you faithfully. We love you, we praise you, and in the name of Jesus, we pray.